Everyone knows well part of the story of the Ray White Group from the really humble beginnings 115 years ago, those old black and white photos of the railway siding and crow's nest really on the edge of wilderness and the move of Ray's family to Brisbane during the depression. But I think Brian's story of his leadership across the group really hasn't been told. He's never really told it. He's never sought to put himself ahead of the business or ahead of the Ray White family. So the opportunity to ensure his story is fully told is, is so compelling. As I remember it, Ray White was a successful real estate business in Brisbane selling mainly houses. It had many competitors that were the same size. So Brian didn't take over a big business. Brian took over a fairly small private business in Brisbane and he's extended it into a multinational company, which I think is probably one of the greatest success stories coming out of Brisbane. I've only recently found out that there was only the one office when he first joined the company. Um, and that's really, that's amazing when you, when you think about it. So in the last 40 to 50 odd years, it's grown from one business to over a thousand in 10 countries. He does not take very much credit at all, if any, for what's happened during his tenure of, of guardianship for the company. I don't think people quite understand where he took the business from. The challenges he faced on the way through really define the opportunity we now have. My name is Brian White. I was born in Queensland in 1941. My earliest recollections are family occasions, and my grandfather, Ray White, was very much involved in those events. A family would gather, and photographs would invariably be taken. And I remember a number of those early photographs, even one when my father was still in army uniform, very early stage, uh, which has um, stayed with me right through my life. Well, it was a very simple uh, environment. There was no talk of the war, the war had now ended. You kept hearing about recovery. We're recovering from a pretty bad period. And my generation has, has been blessed that we had nothing to do with it. And it, it was a pretty blessed time, a very simple time, uh, beach holidays. I, I sort of look back on it as, as sort of really quite golden, golden days. Our home was a very happy home. My father, I remember he would be up in the mornings and he'd be gone, he'd be... Phone calls at night were quite frequent. A telephone was the only means of, of communication. He would probably speak to his father most nights, uh, or his father would ring him, which was sometimes caused aggravation and, and with my mother, etc. Providing for a family, there wasn't a lot of ambition that you did much more with the business than just what you needed to survive. I was only a kid when this was happening. I was certainly aware of the business. Really only visited the business to, to get lollies from my grandfather. You know, he didn't know where he'd, his, his lolly jar was. It was a small business. It was one office. It was in the centre of Brisbane. It probably had um, a total of about 15 staff altogether. But it was seen as a, as a prominent Brisbane business. There were some very strong competitors. All the competition were Brisbane based. When my grandfather moved to Brisbane in um, the early 1920s, when he was um, in his sort of mid 40s then, he was the sort of the newcomer into a very established set of competitors. You think back on the names that I used to hear, all those names have, have disappeared completely. The auction day was a big day. My father, I can remember him, you know, he's so nervous. He would perform the auction and you have sheets. You'd write down the name of the, the buyer and the price. My brother and I were the runners and we'd have to run to the women that were actually managing that whole settlement process. We've always been a very strong auction business. I take that right back to my grandfather. Perhaps one of the keystones of your success, our belief in the auction process. We never lost faith in it. It suddenly started happening, the, the awareness of, hey, the southerners may be coming. A terrifying word southerners meant. Southerners. They're going to come in and take over. The sharpest memory at that time was when my father came home one night and said, LJ Hooker had come to Brisbane and had approached him and said he'd like to buy the business. We all knew of hookers. Um, they were the, the, the big Sydney agents. 
they just started introducing the concept of franchising. The argument that was used was say, well, we're coming and you, you don't sell to us. Well, we're going to, we'll wipe you out. Eventually, my father came home one night and made an announcement. I can remember one of the clearest memories of my entire youth, because it was so sort of dramatic. He said, I've decided not to sell. We'll hang on for as long as we can. And to some degree, I've lived with that ever since. I can remember just the tension in our family. And what happens if the business didn't survive? You know, would we still be able to live in this home? Ray White was a very well respected firm, but it was not a huge firm. It was not anything like some of the other big companies that were working at that stage. I was probably about uh, or oh, 14 and we were at Brisbane Boys College. That's when I really first met Brian. I think the teachers underestimated Brian. They knew he was very bright academically, but I did not think they knew how well he was regarded by other students. I think the masters did not think he was a great leader, but I think they were entirely wrong. We boys knew he was a leader because we followed him. We thought that uh, he was the type of person we would like to be. He was a quiet achiever and he was very focused in his aims at sport and achieved very, very well in his final exams. Brian was always very calm. He never panicked. At the end of uh, our first year in university, we, I remember we um, broke down on the way to Ayers Rock. Brian got out of the car and, and got a chair and sat down and said, well, let's have a beer and think about it whereas I was quite panicking and trying to work out what was wrong with the electrical uh, things in the car. <laughs> oh, I'm sure, I'm sure when times have been tough, I'm sure Brian uh, thinks a lot, doesn't panic, and generally uh, makes the right decision. I did a economics degree at the Queensland University. In essence, I guess I was always going to go into the business. I remember quite an early stage of walking with my father through Brisbane, through the main streets of Brisbane, and virtually every second or third person would say, G'day. Sort of across the road, people would sort of say, hey, Alan, you know, think, holy hell, how am I ever going to get to know these, all these people? How do, I, how do you sort of know a huge part of the community? Turned up the first day and my father said, um, well, we need a rent collector. <laughs> We had probably about five salespeople, and we had a couple doing commercial and industrial. We had a little insurance department, and we had a property management portfolio. The manager of the portfolio was getting close to his retirement, and my father said, this would be good for you to get involved in this and, and, and have some leadership experience probably in the, you know, in the not too distant future. So I started off as a rent collector. I can still see it now, I can see it quite vividly. My first letting showed the property, had the tenant, they all agreed yes. And uh, I was so excited I offered to help them move in <laughs> into the house. Just sort of the excitement of, my God, I've actually completed a transaction. It's pretty, pretty exhilarating. I met Rosemary on the Gold Coast, we were both holidaying down there. I met her through a friend, we at a grocery store and I was introduced. She was engaged at the time to someone else. <laughs> uh, he wasn't there. Uh, and anyhow, um, previous engagement came to an end and it wasn't too long before we started dating. You know, we, we married. No way we went. We met in a corner store on a Friday morning and oh, I thought he was very attractive. We started going out a couple of months later. We got married at the end of the next year. The White family, my first impression was that they really liked each other a lot and um, they were very polite and, you know, they were a very close family. I know my family was very thrilled with Brian. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it was the other way around, but they certainly made a good fist of welcoming me. We were very fortunate. She was obviously a very loving, caring mother, fully devoted to her kids. The memories of, of my childhood couldn't be brighter or happier. I think Rosemary's involvement in the business behind the scenes is often underestimated. I think would we have done a lot of the things we've done without Rosemary's support and the story would have been very different but for Rosemary's support and involvement. I first met uh, Rosemary at the wedding reception. Rosemary and Brian are a partnership and I think this has contributed tremendously to their success. 
I don't think that Brian could ever have achieved what he has without Rosemary. She was a wonderful support to him in business and at home with the family. It's been quite a remarkable partnership, my, my observation, is that they are so vastly different but united on the journey. Well, I suppose you'd look at it, you know, Brian's driving the boat, but Rose is the wind in the sails. Great team. Rosemary got involved in training. She developed our first training programs. I mean, training was almost unheard of. And to some degree, we became known for our training. And we'd often hear people say, oh, if you're going to join the real estate industry, well, go to Ray White's and get trained, then come and join me after that. <laughs> a bit of a backhanded compliment. Women clearly make up 50% of the talent pool in any industry. And we didn't have any women much. I think we had one or two. I think in those days we can't remember any females in the offices, so it's all changed a lot. My father had prided himself that he'd been the first agent in Brisbane to employ a female salesperson. <laughs> Amazing. It, it never happened before. When a woman became married, in some cases it was not legally possible to work. <laughs> so th this, this was right at the beginning of, of, of such a revolution that has happened since then. Because women had taken time off to have children or because they hadn't all achieved the level of education that a man had, there were all these very talented women sitting at home who whom I thought would be really good selling real estate. So I set out advertising for these people and I used to do, put ads in like, you know, you've made the beds, you've put the coffee cups away or whatever, come and have a cup of coffee with Rosemary White and talk about selling real estate. I thought I would have an in with the managers and I'd get, no, nah, no, no, we don't have women. No, 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 women couldn't sell in this area. So that was a battle. You know, we are people and we learn from each other. I was dying to have the experience of actually, what, what is it like to open an office? And it was time for us to open an office on the south side of Brisbane. This would have been our, about our fifth office. I can still remember the first day of opening the excitement of opening ended up having a full page in the Courier Mail and that was the first time that had ever been achieved. Ray White opens on the south side and here we went. I'd expect the phone to be ringing off its hook and not had one phone call. <laughs> 1970 sort of turned, we had around eight to ten offices. Two a year was about the extent of it. We were not comfortable about the concept of franchising. There was that belief that you lost control. Uh, a number of our competitors had already opened franchise business and had opened even other branch offices. So we weren't early in that space at all. Brian's mother wasn't well. She had multiple sclerosis and she was in a wheelchair prior to my having met her. But she was still a very important part of the family, very strong woman. Her sons adored her. You know, Brian's mother's illness had been a great sadness in that family. My mother died in um, early 1972 and uh, that um, you know, obviously a traumatic experience for my family. Alan started to withdraw from the business then in, in 1972 and uh, the real estate market was booming. We had a great year in 72. It was one of the all-time good years. And Brian became the managing director. I was into my early 30s. My father, he, he called me into his office and said, um, just let you know, it's time for me to go. This is your office now. I've got all my papers sort of cleared up. Good luck. Um, do a good job. Be a good leader. And off he went. The biggest shock was, uh, your job is now to be the leader. And I didn't know how to be a leader. By then I was, I had my own family sort of well on its way. Holding a child for the first time, you know, all of us, you know, all fathers, never forget that moment. Um, my God, what is, what, what, what is, what is this? I knew that I, I wanted the, the business to prosper. I was certainly committed to the business by that, you know, by that, that time. It's only in more recent times that I've become confident as a leader. What's the difference between a leader and a manager? And of course the difference is as wide as the earth. And that's something I talk about a lot with our business owners. We've been blessed with the, the commitment of our leaders to us. One of the great 
characteristics he's, he's had along the years that I've seen anyway is being able to pick good leaders. When Brian speaks, or whether it be in a room with a small group of people or a room that's full with 2,000 people, there's a saying that you can hardly hear a pin drop, but I can tell you, I can hardly hear anyone breathing. He captures the room because the sincerity is genuine. Brian's empathy and compassion to people's needs is probably more about leadership than actually anything that you would read or study. I've got books on leadership. I've got hundreds of books. He can read the books, but it doesn't mean anything. The biggest thing is knowing what you want. And many people go into owning a business and they're not quite sure why they've done that. So I've been lucky, I've always known what I've wanted. And that's a huge blessing. My business card really said Brian White Chairman. Uh, if I had more guts and more, being more realistic, it should be Brian White Leader. Because that's my job. And that's, that's always been the case. Leaders always underestimate the impact they have with their people. You know, there's the importance of praise. Brian is a leader in that he knows what he wants. He doesn't veer from anything. You'll, you'll never talk Brian out of something he won't be talked out of. You can't, you know, once, once he's on a path, you can't change his mind. And, and certainly he has been, you know, so lucky to have had some of the talent that he's got with him now. In the early 1970s, there's a fair bit of momentum in built at that time. We had new office opportunities and each office gave an opportunity to open further offices. In our commercial activities, our competitors were now the international agents. A firm called Richard Ellis had begun and they approached us to see whether we'd represent them in Queensland. It was very easy to say yes to that. We were actually still trading courses Ray White but we described ourselves as a member of the Richard Ellis Group and it certainly turned out to be one of our, our better decisions. We became very much involved with Richard Ellis. It encouraged us to start travelling a lot more. Richard Ellis was, played a very critical role when he made the decision to go national as Ray White. The profitability from Richard Ellis was so crucial for a, a very long period of time. Things were moving beautifully and until of course we had the great economic crash during the Whitlam era. It's hard for people to understand just how tough that was. We haven't had anything like that since. Banks stopped lending. And the other thing that came up, which my grandfather talked about during the Depression years, was trading. I have a house, I'll trade that for some land and an investment property and so forth. So it was a very bad few years. All of our offices were losing money and it was one of those tough times. It, it brought out this uh, awareness um, that anything could happen, that the whole, the whole thing could, could fold. The first thing was to say to Rosemary and my family, there's no money. He said, I won't be drawing any money out for a year, so we've got to be really, really frugal. There will be no money coming out of that business. So we're going to have to grow our own food. And the memory is, we said, well, the fastest food you can grow is pumpkins. I got to like growing veggies too. I mean, I, I subsequently did all, you know, voluntarily grow veggies actually, and have seemed to be ahead of my time because everybody now wants to grow veggies. But we did grow veggies in 74, yeah. Well, her support was unconditional. You know, this, is, this is a challenge we all, we all face together. It's just not possible for that business to operate in terms of the whole financial constraints and things that were occurring. So <laughs> you can imagine how difficult it was. Ryan would never let Ray White have any debt, ever. It was always the house on the line. And I was always, please, can we get the house off the line? It was going to go down, not just the business would go down, but the family would suffer. Brian always took almost personal responsibility, not corporate responsibility. So literally everything was on the line. That is unusual in a group this size. There's a great phrase, when things are good, everyone expects them to keep getting better. And when things are tough, everyone expects them to keep getting worse. And both views invariably are wrong. Suddenly our confidence was regained and by 1976, 77 we were again opening additional offices. Of course one of the key tasks is decision making. How do you make decisions because of some instinctive belief? What is good for the development of the business? What is important for tomorrow and not just for today? It's helped frame some of the risks that we've taken. If we do not take these risks then it's going to be far worse. It's probably like the decision to go national. 
I had no confidence. All I knew was if we didn't, it would be far worse. The decision for Ray White to go national was a very instinctive decision. Had we not franchised, I don't think we would have actually had the expansion story that we've actually now got behind us. So I think, again, it was a decision maybe for different reasons that really set the foundation, I think, for what the company is today across Australia, New Zealand and Indonesia. This the obsession to become national it was overwhelming. About the early 1980s, we had strong businesses right down the Gold Coast. We'd just go into Northern Rivers and then go more I sort of creep into Sydney from, you know, from the long road. It suddenly arrived in Sydney as if, as if it was the end of a journey. Uh, we knew that wasn't going to work. We had to hackery make a mark in Sydney, uh, particularly. And as the 1980s sort of went on, the concept came together, have got to do something. Ray White managers were taking on franchises for the, for the southern groups, saying I, I, I'm keen to own my own business. We're mad not to. We had to grow fast. We had to grow a lot faster than just four or five offices a year. By then we'd experimented with a couple of franchises in Queensland and to our amazement they, they were going really well. So the concept was we will franchise. An opportunity cropped up at that time to buy a group called ERA and I seized on that. My brother and I, Paul, we went down, we had our meeting with ERA and said this is what we want to do. Rebrand, ERA, Ray White, and away we went. The history with Ray White goes back to 1984 when the White family uh, purchased ERA, which was an American franchise group, and we were really making headway. We were loyal, loyal ERA agents. And then to suddenly be told in a meeting, we've sold out to, to Ray White was gut-wrenching. And my brother Greg and I are going, who's Ray White? And when they explain they're from Queensland, we're going, you're joking, a Queensland company? Brian had a full crop of hair at that stage. And he, it was a trigger for this enormous growth in the company. And I think the Queensland group got confidence that we were now national and for the ERA officers that we were now part of something much bigger than we were before and that was the beginning of uh, what's been a you know the most significant relationship of our entire career. 45 Ray White officers were selling a hell of a lot more than 100 ERA officers. Often people say more officers you have the better however is market share more important if you've got a higher market share with half the officers is that a better business and that's a a debate that's constant within this industry. Our competitors had also tried to become national. Things had not travelled very well for them. And when you look back at the scene today, there are really very few national groups from a strong provincial background and, and become national. But now we're a cohesive brand. Um, franchising was absolutely the sort of central component of it. As time went on, we became more confident that everyone basically related to us as, as, as a family. When I see Brown White, I just feel like he's my father. With him, I just feel so close. I just feel like a family. That is the most important. Oh, they're like my second family there. Um, unfortunately, I, was, I lost my father when I was quite young, and um, if I ever needed a word of encouragement or advice, you know, Brian, freely offered to um, lead you in the right direction. <laughs> Brian used to get up every morning in the cricket season and go out the backyard to a half cricket pitch and bowl. And the children wanted to be the best they could be. They want to make the A team, they want to make the B team. My father's always been my biggest supporter, always ensured that he was there, not only to support, but encourage me to keep getting better, to set my expectations higher. And that's something that I think is reflected in, in all these kids. It wasn't happening as easy as, you know, people think life happens. It was very hard work and they um, never wavered. They instilled that in their children. They were happy people, happy, hard-working people. A few months after I joined Brian, the stock market crashed in 1987 and we actually had some very specific plans of certain things that were going to occur. When the stock market crash occurred, all those plans had to be completely scrapped, but actually the next day we actually took on some totally new initiatives which weren't even on the agenda at all. But if you actually look back with hindsight and said relative success return, I'd say we've done pretty well. 
We took some opportunities to buy in the early 1990s, this is during the, the recession that did exist, it was a tough time, but a number of brands became available and we seized on those opportunities. So one or two happened in Melbourne, South Australia, a couple in Western Australia, and there was an opportunity emerged in New Zealand. I've been with Throw White for 30 years. I started as a franchisee and then moved into a corporate role. I was actually the first DRA Ray White office in the country. It turned out to be the best decision I ever made. I remember because I'd accepted this position, I was taking my family to New Zealand and he rang me, welcomed me to the company. And then he said something to me which I've never forgotten and it was an amazing piece of advice. He said to me, Stephen, I expect that you will make mistakes and I look forward to working through those with you. Good luck. And that was the end of the conversation. And I put the phone down and I just thought, wow. And the reality is he's, he has actually followed through on that because I make a lot of mistakes. He is very generous when people make mistakes. Brian's attitude is he would rather you had a go and made a mistake than have no action at all. Clearly mistakes are made. And for me to be judgmental on that is ridiculous. Uh, there's no one in our leadership team that makes mistakes because they don't care. When mistakes are made, they wish to learn from it. One of the philosophies that my grandfather had, my father really honed your market properties, you're going to get the benefit, you're going to create competition. It's tougher in recessions. During that time, the philosophy that was espoused by Genman became very attractive. And his philosophy was based upon you don't open your home for inspection. You put a price on the home and then you attack that price. Probably one of the few times we actually lost good businesses to our German philosophy. That, that, that was how our DNA. We have property, you must promote it. And even promoting in tough times. German was anti everything, you know, it was just anti real estate agents. We believed that auctions were right for our clients. And so it was a period of time where Brian had to take the whole concept of auctioning to a new level. And a lesser man, I think, would have buckled, as we saw in other groups. Brian never wavered. And I love the fact right now he's so passionate about Ray White being the competition creators. It's, he's held the faith <laughs> for as long as I've known him. Fortunately, cycles happen. And then suddenly, oh, some good things are happening. Some people did turn up on an auction and the Genman whole system basically lost its high ground. It took till the mid-1990s before we stopped losing money, not before we actually started to make it. The realisation occurred at our centenary conference in 2002. We're doing more business than anyone else. I've been to many celebrations of companies that got to 100, but their best years have clearly been earlier. There's just still that determination to get better. We're not saying, hey, isn't it great when market leaders, let's go and have a good time. We're not a bad position now, but you know what might happen in five years or ten years' time? Brian's never been in a moment where he says, hey, let's celebrate, we're the market leader, look how good we are. It's like, okay, congratulations, we've reached this point, but this is not our destination. And my father used to often say, he said, son, um, make sure you celebrate the good times, but not for too long. <laughs> this real estate industry is littered with competitors who have jumped to conclusions very quickly. The danger is that people think we've made it. There is no finish line. Probably some of the most impressive things I've seen with Brian in his career is when he has been faced with challenges. The big one I think for me was Remax. The Remax type model, the American real estate model, uh, came to Australia. And in a very short period of time, Ray White lost a lot of agents. If I'm correct, it was something like 300 odd salespeople uh, left the group within six or so months. And if he hadn't have pulled that off well, the group as we know it today just wouldn't have existed. Remax came to town. They had a different business model. It really became a threat to the Ray White businesses. Brian wasn't going to take it lying down. In many ways, Remax was a great benefit to us in terms of the challenge. I think the thing with Brian is that he can change his mind and he can change direction, but when he knows he's right, he will stick to his guns. He walks around at night time worrying about things before they happen. 
It scares me about how much he knows. He knows things ahead of time and this has led to just absolute trust. He put trust in me in the movement from Western Australia to New Zealand. I'm sure Brian knew more than what I did about, probably even about me. And he's, he's given me more than what I would have ever, ever expected. So I can remember when the GFC hit. It was, a, it was a really confronting time for all of us, you know, the size of the company and the overheads, and you're kind of getting told daily in the press that the world's about to implode. Cycles are part of this whole thing. We know enough to know that you get through these things. He will absolutely support anyone in his company or any of his people right till the point where he can't. I think that was one of Brian's great strength. He read the play pretty well and, you know, he could cut the cloth if the business was turning down. This is a tough gig in franchising. How can we find answers for people whose effective time as a business owner with us has now passed? If that desire to surge is gone, then we cannot ignore that anymore. People would assume that Brian's ruthless. It's not ruthlessness, it's restlessness. It's, it's a completely different thing. Brian's restlessness and his ambition is probably the key components, from my opinion, that has kept this company constantly moving and never stalling. Power can run out, but ambition becomes infectious, and Brian's ambition and restlessness is just relentless. The Ernst & Young Family Business Award, the Australian representative for that, is a great thrill for Brian. He just, you know, just loves that. To think that the group could be recognised at a world stage is something that I don't think anyone would have ever envisaged so many years ago. And I think if you look through the list, to be on that list, to be the top Australian business on that list, what person wouldn't take that with enormous pride? It was very much about him. Certainly when he accepted it, he reflected back to his family. But really it was, it was an entrepreneur award, it was for his contribution. Seeing this as a, a family award, it is really appropriate that my family comes and joins me. This is not my award. Okay. My brother, who's been with me all the way, my three sons are here. Without this, this team, we would have reached our peak years ago and now be in decline. Well, unfortunately, uh, the real estate industry is full of egos. The word ego and the words Brian White don't go along in the same sentence. There, there is no ego attached to Brian. Brian's one of the most humble men that I've ever met. He always believes that there's something to learn from someone's story. Brian was always taking interest in other people's jobs. He really liked just hearing other people's ideas. One day, fairly early in our relationship, he found out I was a piano teacher. And he said, oh, would you like to teach me? And I just thought, oh, come on, he's kidding. But when he came, he was so enthusiastic. And I found that he, he was really innately musical. I am so pleased that he's keeping up with it. I think a lot of people wouldn't know that about Brian because he doesn't advertise it. So much of the white family upbringing occurred where the boys all loving their surfing and I love this sort of connection to the beach. But quite remarkable, a man of his maturity, to still be able to jump up on a board stand and ride a wave. Brian never thinks in terms of age. Brian just gets up and gives gives it everything to life every day. I often speak to him and I seem to catch him on a Saturday morning when he's on his way to tennis or whatever. He has a tennis lesson still. His time in life, he's still looking to improve. He gives that to me every day that we can be better. And that directly comes from him. We're already the number one office ac across Australasia. Still, we think we can be so much better. Becoming effective as a leader has uh, that's been my biggest challenge, without, without question. But of course that's changing now that my son's taking much stronger leadership roles in the company, that leadership is now so quickly becoming right into their corner. All the whites all work hard. They all work long hours, they're not slackers, they never sleep in. My mother, she was keen to ensure her sons were, were good students and worked you know, hard from a young age and ensuring we had a choice in life. Brian and, and, and the boys are the hard work, most hardworking human beings that I've, I think I've ever seen. The work ethic and the drive and the demeanour of the boys is what's going to drive the, the company forward and that is so rock solid. I 
remember something just recently. One of his boys was up speaking on the stage and I saw the look on Brian's face, you know, this immense pride. And I've seen this on a number of occasions lately. Questions we have is, can we go a lot broader than Australia and New Zealand? We're now clearly the market leader across Indonesia. There's over 11,000 listings of resale property on one of the websites that Ray White has. The nearest competitor is under 5,000. We have our own office in China. We're looking at a number of opportunities now across Asia. Our first office we even have now in the, in the United States. I thought he would be very successful, but not to the extent that he has. It's just an amazing business. And to think it came from Crow's Nest and Brisbane, it's just amazing. To go from one to a thousand uh, is just an incredible, an incredible effort. How do you make a real estate business in 1902 go through 115 years to over 1,000 offices and 15,000 members? Growth is the oxygen of our company, and unless we're really sucking that in, then we're basically suffocating. I'll be forever grateful for my relationship with him. Followed through from Alan to a big extent. I think he was very much like Alan in his demeanour and his presence. I would imagine Alan would be extremely proud and Ray would be just blown away, I would think. For the next generation, I think there's that sense between us all of custodianship. Knowing where we've come from gives us a lot of confidence, a lot of belief in what we can achieve. I think the future of our industry is extremely exciting. The challenge is to remain the hunter, not the hunter. His investment in, in his senior team is way above and beyond what you would normally expect. I want to stay in that environment and I'm sure that my colleagues do too. There's no better place that I could be. I couldn't be anywhere else. You can imagine how proud Ray and Alan would be. Well, I'm certainly proud that I've kept the faith of my grandfather and my father. And it's, uh, it's very satisfying.